The readings this morning is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. If you're using the Church Bibles, you'll find that on page 1014. That's 1014. Mark, chapter 10, and we're reading from verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud, honour your mother and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this The man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked round and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up, we have left everything to follow you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, along with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. This is the word of God. Amen. Let's come to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that this is the living word of the living God. And we pray that as we come to it now, your Holy Spirit may illumine the page. that We may hear your voice and respond obediently to it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jesus met a yuppie. The definition of a yuppie is a young urban professional or a young, upwardly mobile professional. It's a word that appeared first in a Chicago magazine in 1980, and in the subsequent years often was used of middle-class young people who focused on material wealth and financial success. The passage before us begins in verse 17 with a man who, if he had lived 2,000 years later, might well have been classed or described as a yuppie. Luke tells us this man was a ruler. Matthew tells us this man was young. And Mark tells us this young man was also very rich. A rich young ruler. A man in the prime of life. A man of position, power, status. A man with plenty to live for. I want to draw your attention to five key things in the passage before us. And the first is this, the key issue, the issue of eternal life. 
As we read these verses, Mark paints for us a very vivid picture of this man. There's a sense of urgency and humility in Mark's record. We notice that this man ran up to Jesus. Gives us an indication that here is someone who will not let an opportunity pass. Here is someone who has an important matter on his heart. Here is someone who urgently needs his inquiry addressed. The very fact that he ran indicates this is not an old man, but someone with energy and vigour. Matthew tells us he's a young man. This man fell on his knees before Jesus. Here is someone whose posture indicates respect. Here's someone whose attitude reveals humility. Here's someone whose demeanour shows desire. This sign of submission is all the more impressive when we learn from Luke that this young man is a ruler, probably a religious leader, a leader in his local synagogue. So he may be young, but he already occupies a significant and responsible role. As this man comes to Jesus, he calls him, you'll notice, good teacher. Perhaps here is one who has heard something of the Saviour's message. Perhaps he's been listening, a member of the crowds that have gathered. Perhaps he has been impressed by the reports that others have given him. Perhaps he simply wants to make a gesture of respect. This man, records Mark, had great wealth. He may be young, but he is already rich as well as a ruler. In today's terms, he's either been born with inherited wealth or he's a high flyer, an early achiever. But either way, he has all the trappings of position and money and power. I want you to imagine him in the world of 2023. He lives in a plush pad. He drives a top-range car. He has every conceivable electronic gadget. He holidays around the globe. He has an attractive lady constantly on his arm. He has, it would seem, everything. Well, not quite everything. Though on the surface all is well, deep within there is a real vacuum a great concern, an awareness of a deep need, a recognition that something crucial is missing. So what is this unsatisfied need? What is this troubling burden? What is this cause of urgency and humility he now demonstrates as he comes to the Saviour? This man has an issue that he is convinced Jesus can resolve. And what is the issue? It is this, eternal life. Life beyond this present earthly existence. He raises an issue that goes to the heart of our very nature and being. It's a matter that points to the very purpose and destiny of mankind. It's amazingly profound. This man is not only a young, rich ruler, he's also serious. He's concerned, he's troubled, he's sombre about the issue of eternal life. I want to ask you this morning, what issues concern you? You see, one of the features of our society today is that we have become absorbed with trivia. As we examine social media and other outlets, we find so often a focus on the unimportant, and a desire to ignore the very real big questions of life. Now that shouldn't surprise us. We live in a fallen world. A society caught up with sin is hardly likely to willingly consider God and his will and his ways. And so it is, even with births and bereavements. Those things, those experiences that speak to us of a God who gives and takes away. We find the very questions of why we're here, 
What's the purpose of life? Where is God? Being submerged by our modern superficial age. This rich young man is to be commended. Commended in that he is concerned with eternal issues. And he was determined, determined that this opportunity would not pass him by. And he was serious in his inquiry. Let me say to you this morning that your very presence reflects at least some interest in the things of God. My prayer is that you may have a serious concern about eternal life. It's strange, isn't it, that we spend so much of our time preparing. Schooling is gaining an education to prepare us for work. Work is gaining a pension to prepare us for retirement. We prepare months in advance for holidays. We prepare weeks in advance for Christmas. We prepare at least days in advance for examinations. But many people do not prepare even an hour in advance for eternity. You see, the only certainty of life, unless Jesus Christ returns first, is that you and I will die. Death is the great common denominator of life. It transcends every human division. It crosses all barriers of race, religion, sex, age. So do you ever consider the most profound issue, the issue of eternal life? Do you think about life beyond the grave? Our passage challenges us. Are we prepared? Are we prepared for death and prepared for meeting with God? The key issue is the issue of eternal life. But there is secondly, you'll notice, a key question here. And it's how we obtain eternal life. This young man has a question he desperately wants answered. Here it is. What must I do, he asks, to inherit eternal life? The hub of this man's question can only be vital and important if there is life after death. And clearly this man believed that there was. Some today deny life after death. They do so at their peril. Denying life after death, they deny the teaching of the Bible and they call God a liar. Abraham, you'll remember, was looking for the promised land, a land beyond this present earthly experience. Christ comes, and John 3, 16, perhaps the most famous verse in the Bible, tells us that Christ has come out of the love of God the Father so that we may have eternal life. Jesus teaches, and he speaks of the narrow way that leads to life. He tells his disciples, I go to prepare a place for you, a prepared place for a prepared people. He dies on a cross. He's laying in a tomb. He rises victorious over sin and Satan and death itself. Life after death. There are others who ask this hard question. If God is love, can there be help? In other words, if there is life beyond death, then surely, if God is love, all go to heaven. At least the man in our story understood there was some qualification, some price to pay regarding heaven and gaining eternal life. In a sense, Jesus takes this young man to the crossroads in life. The crossroads where the route that is determined determines your destiny. My responsibility this morning is to tell you that as you come under the sound of the gospel, you are brought to a crossroads. Where will it lead? Will it lead to life or to death? Will it lead to heaven or to hell? And some, as we consider this question would say, well, I'm a Christian, to which I would reply, let's see, as we examine this passage, 
together. You see, there are tragically many folk who still believe today that we can be born a Christian or that we can become a Christian by going to church or by living a good life or by being baptised. The Bible is very clear that there is life after death. It lies at the heart of the good news that Jesus came to proclaim in his life and provide for through his death. The question this rich young ruler asks is therefore valid and relevant. He desires eternal life rather than eternal damnation. He has heard that Jesus has spoken of a life that never ends. He's heard that Jesus has spoken of a kingdom of God. He realises that this present life has a bearing on the next. So he asks this key question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Not only is there a key issue, not only is there a key question, there is, you'll notice, a key word. And the key word in this passage is the word do. You see, it's the cornerstone of this man's thinking. He believes that he can earn, work, give his way to heaven. Almost every week on the news, we hear stories of folk who find themselves in need of being rescued. Perhaps they've been climbing mountains Perhaps they've been trekking in remote areas. Perhaps they've been diving in deep seas. And they get caught up maybe in atrocious weather conditions or through some other circumstances. And they find themselves in a situation that requires outside help. A mountain rescue team is assembled. A helicopter is scrambled. A lifeboat is launched. You see, what this young man did not understand was that there was nothing for him to do, nothing he could achieve. He was in a situation which required outside help. And here is the gospel message. God has done it. Jesus tells us that in verse 27. All things, he says, are possible with God. The Apostle Paul understood this fundamental truth. As he writes to the church at Rome, he writes of being justified through faith. He acknowledges that the wages of sin is death, but praises God that the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Centuries ago, Martin Luther experienced something of this young man's dilemma. He discovered that the more he attempted to obtain an assurance of eternal life by his own efforts, the further away it seemed to go. This man has used good lightly, not realising that Jesus is good. For he is God and as Jesus reminds him, there is no one who is good except God alone. Jesus is seeking to teach above everything else that despite his good deeds, despite his claim to have kept the commands, this man was not good in God's sight. I find this young man fascinating. You see, there's something of an interesting mixing him that we often find in younger folk. Overconfident in some situations, lacking in confidence in others, boastful, reckless one moment, lost, uncertain the next. But it's not just younger folk. It's also a mix that we find in many people of all ages. You see, despite this man's lack of assurance of eternal life, you'll notice that this young man had clearly confidence in his own goodness judged by the standard of the law. As he waited for Jesus' reply, he anticipated a hard and no doubt worthy task. 
He expected some particular action or perhaps a donation or maybe a pilgrimage to be specified. But whatever the challenge, this young man was up for it. He confidently and he saw himself being successful. What must I do, he said, to inherit eternal life? The very question reveals that this man expected himself to be the focus of the answer. That Jesus would say to him, do this, give that, go there. That was the type of reply he awaited. It's the same line of thinking behind the religions and cults of our day. There is something within the pride of fallen man that attracts this idea that we have a part to play in our salvation. It's a concept that separates every other world religion from the truth of Christianity. This idea that we may earn the reward of eternal life. This idea that we may achieve qualification. This idea that somehow we can obtain God's pass mark. The Apostle Paul knew himself too well. I know that nothing good lives in me, he said. That is, in my sinful nature. The Apostle understood that the only thing we can contribute to the work of salvation is our sin from which God will save us. Men and women are saved, not on account of our doing, but on account of God's giving. The hymn writer put it like this. Give me a sight, O Saviour, of thy wondrous love to me, of the love that brought thee down to earth to die on Calvary. O make me understand it. Help me to take it in, what it meant to thee, the Holy One, to bear away my sin. Christ has done all that is necessary. There is nothing for us to do and nothing we can do. The key word is do. The key response is love. Jesus knew this young man's outward obedience to the law since childhood. He knew he was a typical dedicated Jew. Notice, will you, Jesus looked at him and loved him. How does Mark know that? It isn't expressed in the conversation. The Saviour himself doesn't tell us. Yet it must have been so obvious that it made an impact upon the Gospel writer Mark and upon the disciple Peter to whom he spoke. Jesus looked at him and loved him. What a beautiful phrase. The eyes of Jesus spoke of love. The manner of Jesus spoke of care. The attitude of Jesus spoke of grace. In a world of little love, Jesus loves you. Remember that. Jesus loves you. When Jesus responded, one thing you lack. To the man, it was a matter of addition. Do this extra thing. To Jesus, it was a matter of substitution. Something needs to change. One thing you lack. You see, the problem with this young man is the problem with all of us in our fallen state. Self is at the centre not God. Self needed to be taken away and the Saviour seated on the throne of this man's heart. And my friends, this morning, if you're here, whether you're a regular attender or on holiday, if you're not yet a child of God, this is God's word to you. You may have led a good life, you may feel able to give the same testimony as this young man that you have sought to keep every command of God. But I need to tell you, there is one thing you lack. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. 
Jesus offers this man secure treasure, as he offers us. Secure treasure for insecure treasure. You see, the response of Jesus' questions, where our priorities lie, where our love is focused. Some may feel that this man was dealt harshly with by the Saviour. After all, hadn't he kept all the commandments? The answer, of course, is no. He had failed at the very first one. His wealth was his God. You shall have no other gods before me. This man had not kept all the commandments. My friends, there can be many obstacles in the way of trusting Jesus. Not just wealth and materialism, possessions, sport, friends, family, a wrong relationship, a habit, a hobby, a job, a career. Whatever is on your heart, if it's not the Lord, is an obstacle to coming to faith. Jesus says, give it up. It is not the thing itself, it is the position they occupy. You see, it's the love of money, not money, which is the root of all evil. Key response, the love of Christ. Finally, a key result. What was the outcome of this meeting with Jesus? What happened to this rich young ruler, this yuppie, this wealthy go-getter? Is there a happy ending to the passage? I'm afraid there isn't. Verse 22 tells us he went away sad. For this rich young man, his God was wealth and materialism. And giving up his God was too much. This morning, if you leave here without Jesus... I have to tell you, whatever your appearance, inside you will go away sad. Jesus Christ is the true God and eternal life, wrote the Apostle John. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. The hymn writer picked up on that theme. The dearest idol I have known, whate'er that idol be, Help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. So let me ask you, who or what is on the throne of your life? Who or what is at the centre of your affection? Is there something or someone stopping you coming to Jesus? The Saviour was very clear in his teaching. What good is it, he asked, for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? We need to understand that in Judaism, riches were seen as divine favour. Salvation for rich or poor, says God, is impossible, but not impossible for God. So it is that Paul writes, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Imagine if salvation was by works. Imagine if this rich young ruler had gone away to do whatever the task Christ had set for him. How proud and boastful he would have been. How he was humbled, he went away sad. The cost of salvation, too great. I need to tell you this morning that men and women, rich and poor, young and old, people who have attended a church, people who have shown some interest in the things of God, people who have raised profound issues, People who have asked serious questions are yet people who have gone away sad. 
Sad because the cost was too great. Sad because the change in priorities was too demanding. Sad because the call to discipleship was too dramatic. I'm old enough to remember celebrating when England won the World Cup. It did happen in my lifetime, you'll be surprised by that. In every subsequent football competition, even now with the ladies, there is this hype beforehand. The media and sometimes even the players seem already to be celebrating. But again and again and again, we have finally failed. Sometimes so near, and yet in reality, so far. This young man was near the kingdom, and yet so far. Humanly speaking, we would think surely Jesus would want this young man on his team. A man with gifts and wealth and abilities. Couldn't Jesus make some allowance, water down his standards? Sinclair Ferguson writes, Jesus never pursued slick and easy methods of evangelism, and neither must we. Go, sell everything. You see, we need to understand that Jesus gives us more than we give up. In the words of 1 Peter 1, he gives us the imperishable as we give up the perishable. The answer Jesus gives forces this man to recognise that his only hope is utter reliance upon God. He must rid himself of the props of this life. Go sell everything, then come, follow me. Self-surrender leads to discipleship. What must I do? Salvation is found in no one else. You must go to Jesus. Warren Wearsby wrote, If you possess money, be grateful and use it for God's glory. But if money possesses you, beware. Sinclair Ferguson wrote, This meeting of Jesus and a rich young ruler stands as a perpetual monument to the fact that if we have everything but have not Christ, we ultimately have nothing. What must I do? Jesus says, go to the foot of the cross at Calvary. Confess your sin. Repent and turn and go in a new direction. Come, follow me. Let's come to God in prayer. Let us pray. In the quietness of this place, we spend a moment in reflection upon God's word. Consider the most important issue of the day, eternal life. The most important question of the day, how can we obtain eternal life? The most important answer, follow Jesus. Surrender all to the Saviour. Whatever dominates your life, whatever is on your throne, whatever would consume you, whatever would be your primary focus. If it is not Christ, my friend, you're outside the kingdom. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. May it be so for Jesus' sake. Amen.